Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for braving the weather. Somebody pointed out to me that we're not in Atlanta or any other parts of the, state, the, the nation, so we need to suck it up and, and be thankful. Um, so yes, we are here this morning for Man Up, changing the culture of violence in our community. I'm Yvonne Fry. I chair the Hillsborough Commission on the Status of Women, and on behalf of our organization, I'd like to thank you each for being here, and I'm sure this will be a dynamic and thought-provoking forum. Right now, would the members, the other other members of the Commission on the Status of Women, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. The Commission on the Status of Women was created to advise the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners on all matters pertaining to the status of women in our community. While we focus on women, the reality is that all issues that affect women in our community equally affect men because we're interdependent. That's why we chose to make the subject of this year's forum engaging men as leaders in ending gender violence. Last year, our forum topic was domestic minor sex trafficking, and we learned that there are men in our community that are passionately dedicated to ending child sex slavery. We hope to build on the success of last year's forum and generate collaborations and momentum to end all forms of gender violence. We have some wonderful relationships with women's organizations, like the Junior League of Tampa, who's represented today with Lee Lowry's here. Thank you for being here. A leader in the movement to abolish child sex slavery. The League has done great work with that. The Athena Society, who will be hosting their issues forum next week on the role the media plays with regards to domestic violence. I know we have many members, and Sylvia Carley chairs the um, Community Action Committee that's hosting that luncheon next week. We need men, though just as much as women, to see gender violence as their issue and work together and alongside us to bring peace to our communities. And looking out here today, um, the lights are bright, but I can see you, and I'm very excited about the possibilities. And, and again, my thanks. At this time, I'd like to introduce Mindy Murphy. Mindy is president and CEO of the Spring of Tampa Bay, which is Hillsborough County's certified domestic violence shelter. In her capacity as CEO, she also serves on the Commission on the Status of Women. And I'd appreciate you all joining me and giving her a big round of applause. She's chaired this event today and has worked long and hard with her staff, and we appreciate all that she's done. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you everyone for being here. The best part of what I get to do is introduce Dr. Jackson Katz. Jackson is an educator, author, filmmaker, and cultural theorist who is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work in gender violence prevention education and critical media literacy. In 1993, Dr. Katz co-founded the multiracial mixed gender mentors in violence program known as MVP at Northeastern University's Center for the Study of Sport and Society. MVP introduced the bystander approach to the concept of gender violence prevention field, and Dr. Katz is a key architect of this approach. Today, MVP is one of the most influential gender violence and bullying prevention programs in secondary and post-secondary education in North America and beyond. MVP is also the mo most widely utilized sexual violence and relationship abuse prevention program in college and professional athletics in North America. It has been implemented by numerous teams in the NFL, the CFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball, as well as NASCAR and many other sports organizations. In 1997, Dr. Katz created and directed the first worldwide gender violence prevention program in the history of the United States Marine Corps. He and his colleagues have been centrally involved in the development and implementation of bystander intervention training service-wide in both the Air Force and the Navy. MVP has also worked with the U.S. Army on bases in the States and overseas in Iraq. From 2000 to 2003, Dr. Katz was a member of the U.S. Secretary of Defense's Task Force on Domestic Violence in the Military. And as an aside, I'm delighted that there are so many uh, folks here from MacDill Air Force Base uh, today. We really appreciate their support of this important program. So. And equally as important, we appreciate all you do to keep America safe and all that you all sacrifice for us. Thank you. Dr. Katz is the creator of Tough Guys, the award-winning and widely used educational video. The long-awaited Tough Guys 2 was just released. 
His first book was entitled The Macho Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women and How All Men Can Help. His second book, entitled Leading Men, Presidential Campaigns and the Politics of Manhood, was published last year. He has a blog on masculinities and politics on the Huffington Post. He has appeared on radio and TV programs across North America, Europe, and Australia, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, Good Morning America, ABC News 2020. Katz, a former high school football star, became the first man at the University of Massachusetts Amherst to earn a minor in women's studies. He holds master's degrees from Harvard Graduate School of Education and a PhD in cultural studies and education from UCLA. A native of Boston, he lives with his family in the Los Angeles area. Please help me welcome Dr. Jackson Katz. Wow, let me uh, ask you a question before I begin. Is it gonna be okay if I step out from behind the podium? Are you sure? It's not gonna offend any sensibilities? I think that I will do that. Um, as you'll see, this is not a f formal presentation. I mean, I have lots to say, of course, but I'm gonna be inviting your participation and interaction and um, throughout the course of this time, which is gonna go really quickly, okay? So I'm gonna step out from behind the podium. Let me just actually, um, share with you uh, uh, an anecdote from my own experience that deals with some podium uh, geography. Um, I do a lot of uh, trainings, workshops, presentations all over in different settings, and a couple of years ago I was set to do this three-hour block of instruction for a conference of police chiefs from throughout Southern California, right? So I was in Palm Springs, California. We, I had this three-hour time slot with these powerful chiefs, 90 of them, 97% of them are uh, men, as you might expect, and the vast majority of those men were white men. I walked into this room and I sensed, maybe I was projecting, but I sensed a little kind of reticence in the body posturing of some of the chiefs. And I was behind the podium in this conference center. And so I said to the chiefs, I said, do you mind if I step out from behind the podium? I'm thinking I'm gonna loosen up the room a little bit. And one of the chiefs yells out, yeah, it makes you a better target. So, <laughs> didn't start out particularly well, but let me, let, me, let me say, in fairness, I thought it was fine. It's fine. It, was, it went fine, from my point of view, uh, after that little rocky start. Uh, but I have to say, at the moment that chief uh, opened his mouth, I knew, I knew he had just given me a great gift, which is that he had given me an anecdote that I could share with you, you know what I mean? And, and so, so uh, even though it might have been unintentional, he was actually supporting my work. Um, but I don't sense that same level of reticence in this room. I, you know, who knows? I haven't really said anything. But I, I appreciate that you're here. Um, I appreciate very much that Mindy and your colleagues, Yvonne and your colleagues, um, made this possible and invited me to be part of it. So this is great. Thank you. And let me say along those lines something about women's leadership and men's leadership, because we're focusing on men today, right? But women's leadership has made possible, a conversation between and among men that is, I hope, groundbreaking and transformative. And it's important, I think, when men have the opportunity and the stage and the microphone and the spotlight, if you will, that men like myself and others acknowledge that none of the work that we're doing would be possible were it not for the leadership of women, both on a personal level, obviously, but, but also on a political level, on a social and historical level. Women have been, by far, in a multicultural sense and in an international sense, the leaders in all of this. Women have built the battered women's movements and the movements against sexual assault and sexual violence and sexual harassment, the sexual abuse of children. Women have want, been the ones who have taken the heat for being the leaders, the groundbreakers. This is the, in this country and all over the world, even as we speak, women are taking risks with their lives in many instances, not just, not just committing their time and energy, but taking li literally risks with their lives to speak out about this subject matter. And some men are too, I appreciate that. But there's no doubt that women's leadership is so critical and has been and will continue to be. And I think it's important that we honor and respect and show gratitude to those women, especially, again, when we as men are going to be taking more of a step forward as leaders, don't you think? All right, so thank you. Um, now, having said that, of course, I'm going to focus on men and, 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 and men's leadership in this time that we have here together. I have a bunch of different things prepared for you. 
One is I'm going to obviously talk and give you some framework to think about these issues, I hope, in a, in a new way for some and then reinforce it for others. I'm um, going to use the old tech for a couple of exercises using, using linguistic discussions and such. Um, obviously, we're going to take a break. It'll be a short break because we really are going to be challenged for, for time. And um, I'm going to share with you uh, uh, somewhat after the break uh, the whole bystander approach and what we and my colleagues and I do in the, in the, in the sports culture, in the military culture. I appreciate the Air Force personnel here. Thank you very much. Um, in schools, in other words, the pedagogical strategy that we've been, we've been developing over the past 20 years, I'll share with you some of the basics of it the bystander approach, and you'll, you'll see if you're not acquainted yet. And then towards the end, I'm going to show you some clips, depending on time, depends on how many clips, but some clips from my films and other people's films. We'll talk a little bit about the cultural environment that we're uh, raising uh, boys and girls, uh, men and women, and uh, how the media culture helps to shape the social norms that we're here to uh, try to transform. Because I think, it's un I think it's just naive to think that we can address these issues in the way that I think needs to happen without critically examining the role of media, because media is just so incredibly uh, influential in shaping social norms. And so we'll spend a little time, and again, please understand, my perspective on what I'm going to be doing with you is giving you some ideas, some paradigm-shifting conceptual frameworks, some exercises, and some introductory kind of uh, understandings but nothing, this is nothing like a comprehensive training, you understand? There's so much more where all of this comes from. And one of the things you have, I hope, is a packet, right, of stuff that you got as you came in. And one of the pieces of literature in the packet is a resource list. And so if you're interested in any of the constituent parts of my presentation or this dialogue, if you're interested, there are ways to get much more by checking out some of those resources, okay? So please understand that I'm, I'm hoping to stimulate some thought and some, and some creative uh, uh, leadership, really, um, but uh, this is just the first step, and, 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 and there it is. I'm also going to invite, like I said, your participation. And again, my challenge as a, as a presenter is try to figure out uh, when to encourage and when to, like, I got to, you know, stop because I got to move on. And, and so I know that there are going to be times when people raise their hand and people want to say something, and I'm going to have to say, great, but I'm sorry, we really do have to move on, okay? So please know that that's just because of our constraints with time, okay? Is all this fair and clear? All right, great. Not that I would change it if you said no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. So I'm going to begin by sharing with you a paradigm-shifting perspective on the issues of gender violence. I'm going to use the word gender violence inclusive of sexual assault, domestic violence, sexual harassment, because it's too clunky to say it every time, every, listing every, uh, every specific uh, category. But I'm going to say gender violence, okay? Historically, the issues of gender violence have been seen by most people as women's issues that some good men help out with. That's the frame. And even to this day, in 2014, a lot of people think, okay, these are women's issues. There's some good guys who uh, you know, support women, who support events like this, who write a check who, uh, uh, to support a do domestic sexual violence program, or what have you. I mean, and I appreciate that's, you know, men are supportive in those ways. But I don't understand these issues as women's issues that some good men help out. In fact, I think the very act of calling them women's issues is part of the problem for a number of reasons. And I'm going to share with you several. The first is that it gives men an excuse not to pay attention, right? A lot of men hear the term women's issues and we tend to tune it out and think, hey, I'm a guy. That's for the girls or that's for the women. And a lot of men literally don't get beyond the first sentence as a result. It's almost like a chip in our brain is activated, and the neural pathways take our attention in a different direction when we hear the term women's issues. This is also true, by the way, of the word gender, because a lot of people hear the word gender, and they think it means women, right? So they think that gender issues is synonymous with women's issues. There's some confusion about the term gender. And actually, let me illustrate that confusion by way of analogy. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about race for a moment, okay? In the U.S., when we hear the word race, a lot of people think immediately that that means African American or Latino or Asian American or Native American or South Asian or Pacific Islander. Or a lot of people, when they hear the word sexual orientation, they tend to think it means gay, lesbian, bisexual. And a lot of people, when they hear the word gender, they think it means women. In each case, the dominant group doesn't get paid attention to. As if white people don't have some sort of racial 
identity or belong to some racial category or construct, as if heterosexual people don't have a sexual orientation, as if men don't have a gender. This is one of the ways that dominant systems maintain and reproduce themselves, which is to say the dominant group is rarely challenged to even think about its dominance, because that's one of the key characteristics of power and privilege, the ability to go unexamined, lacking introspection or self-awareness, in fact being rendered invisible in large measure in the discourse or the conversation about issues that are often centrally about us. It's amazing how this works, this invisibility of the dominant group. And I'm going to give you a handful of examples how it plays out linguistically, right? So you'll hear people ask things like, how many women um, at Hillsborough Community College or University of Florida or, or you know, whatever uh, were raped last year, not how many men raped women? Or you'll hear people say things like, in Tampa, how many girls in the Tampa school district were abused or harassed last year, not how many boys abused or harassed girls, or how many girls abused or harassed girls. Or you'll hear people say things like, in the state of Florida, how many teenage girls got pregnant last year, not how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. In each case, the use of the passive voice has a very powerful political effect, and the effect is the shift in focus off of men and boys and onto girls and women. This is not a coincidence. This doesn't just happen. It is how power functions, in this case through invisibility. And one of our challenges, those of us trying to change the paradigm, one of the challenges that we have is that very linguistic structures that are built into the everyday conversation conspire to keep our attention off of, of men and boys, if, if you will, the dominant group, and, and uh, focused on the, uh, the, the victims, if you will. Um, even the term violence against women is a problematic term, a term that I would not use without critically um, uh, examining. So what's missing from the term violence against women? Men, in other words, the active agent is missing, right? It's a, in linguistic terms, it's a passive construction, violence against women. It's a bad thing that happens to women. Nobody's doing it to them, but they are experiencing it. If you insert the active agent, men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate, isn't it? It's more honest, isn't it? Now, I, I understand, let me just be clear. I understand that there's women's violence against women. Okay, I understand that. There's lesbian battering, there's mother-to-daughter child abuse, there's female-to-female, peer-to-peer harassment, abuse, and violence. Absolutely. But let's be clear. The vast majority of violence against women in the world is done by men. And the overwhelming majority of sexual violence against women is done by men. But you wouldn't know that by the term violence against women because there's no men in the term. Right? So, Again, when you insert the active agent and you say men's violence against women, it's a more accurate statement, it's a more honest statement, but let me say, and I know some of you know this, some men are very uncomfortable with that level of honest and accurate language and can be very defensive in the face of it, can't they? Now, even, even some women, in what I would consider a misguided attempt to defend men against some supposed attack, sometimes women will even say, oh, you know, what are you doing? But it's mostly men. And I'm going to characterize men's, some men's, again, I'm just saying it's some men, not all men, but I'm going to characterize some men's defensive reaction to the even very phrase, men's violence against women. What are you saying? All men are, all men are you know, rapists or abusers? I can't stand these totalizing statements about all men. Yes, yeah, some men get some problems. Some men need to be held accountable. Some men need, men need help or treatment. Some men need to be locked up. But it's, not, it's about some individual sick men, not men. And I'm a man, and I don't abuse women. And my boys or my friends don't abuse women. And I can't stand these totalizing you know, feminist uh, you know, anti-male rants. You know? All you said was men's violence against women is a big problem in our society, which it is, indisputably. It's a huge problem in our society and all over the world. But it shows you how defensive some men can be in the face of this honest language. Um, and men's defensiveness, by the way, to me, is not just about individual men's feelings. You know, like we have to take care of this guy's feeling because he's feeling a little bruised or he's feeling a little targeted or something. I appreciate that plays out like that on a micro level. But on a macro level, men's defense Defensiveness plays a very powerful political role. And you know what the political role it plays? It plays a role in shutting down critical thinking, shutting down critical dialogue, and preventing forward movement. It is a defense of the status quo. Men's defensiveness is a defense of the status quo. Because what happens when men shut down is women don't engage with them. And men and women 
just, you know, okay, we can't really say things. We can't really say that it's a men's issue. We can't really say that men are the ones, that, that it's male culture because some guys are going to get defensive and they're not going to go very far with that conversation. It's going to shut down. And in fact, women in the domestic and sexual violence fields over the past couple of decades at least have learned that if they want to be successful in working with men, especially in places where they have to be successful, so for example, in law enforcement, which is still dominated by men, in the courts, the judicial judiciary, um, in the state legislatures that have funding you know, for programs or such, even in inter interpersonal relationships, uh, whether it's husbands, boyfriends, certainly in um, the workplace, a lot of women has, have realized, you know what, it's not worth getting into arguments with men about these issues, you know, I'm not going to really fight that battle right now, because you know what, I need to get, serve the victims and survivors, that's my main focus, so what's the point of getting into an argument about this? I need the support of this person or this organization. I need to work collaboratively with them. So I'm going to use gender neutral terms. I'm going to pretend that this is not really a gender issue. I'll say things like, you know, well, you know, most of the victims are female and most of the perpetrators are male, but it's not really gender issue. There are male victims. You know, there are female perpetrators. You know, I appreciate that women in the field have had to make those kind of accommodations. But let's be clear, this is a gender issue. This gender is the heart of all of this. And by the way, even when women are the perpetrators, gender is still at the heart of it. This is another thing that drives me crazy. People say, well, women do it too, so it's not a gender issue. It's like everybody, you can't just say that gender is not a category, and you're just going to pretend that, it, that it's, it's, it's somehow not influential. Even when girls and women perpetrate violence, it's a gender thing, because gender is a central organizing principle in human civilization. Okay? It has in, in, enormous impacts on every different level. But I'm not, and by the way, let me just say, I'm not going to criticize women, especially women in the field, for not using direct and honest language, because that would be completely inappropriate for me as a man and as a you know, white man with some privilege. I'm not going to criticize women. Okay? But I am saying that one of the things that men can do and men's leadership can do in this work is we can say some things that women can't say, or more accurately, we can be heard saying some things that sometimes women can't be heard saying. That's not fair. I don't think that is fair. And I know if I were a woman, I'd be pretty ticked off that my voice wouldn't be as heard as a man saying the same thing. I, I appreciate that. But you know what? It's, it's, it, the reality is that we are in a, men in a position to say some things and be heard saying some things because of the privilege that we have. Um, and I think it's important that we do say that and that we have men who are willing to stand with women as allies and strongly support women and go into parts of male culture. That's the other piece of this. Go into parts of male culture that have historically been either apathetic about these issues or sometimes openly hostile to women's efforts to engage them. We as men have a are in a position to do some of that stuff. And it's a lot harder to sustain the charge against us, those of us who are men, that we're male bashers, that we hate men, that we have an anti-male agenda. It's a lot harder to sustain that charge against us than it would be if we were women uh, saying similar things. Having said that, let me just say that men who do say some of the stuff that I'm saying do get some pushback. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you about that. If you read my email or Facebook or uh, some of the comment sections of some of the YouTube clips of my stuff that's been in the, uh, you know, online for a while, you'd see that there's a lot of pushback that I and others get as well. And you know, you know what the nature of some of that pushback is? It's attacks, basically, right? Some of it's vile and violent, um, but, but certainly, and, and women, by the way, have been dealing with this forever as well. Women who speak up and just say, I want to be treated with respect, women should be treated with respect, get called nasty names, get, get, get shouted down by men who are threatened by women's strength and by women standing up for themselves. But men like myself get called names as well. But I, I, want, to, I want to just give you a couple examples because I think it's instructive about the ways that men when, take, when we take leadership on this issue, the ways that we are attempted to be silenced or shut down or written off. So I'll give you some examples of what I've been called. I'm, I'm routinely called a mangina. Have you heard that one? <laughs> <laughs> That's a common one. Um, I'm, 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 I'm often referred to as a beta male. Okay, so I'm a beta male as opposed to an alpha male because a real man wouldn't be taking a stand on these issues. So some, some desk jockey sitting at his computer screen is calling me a beta male, so I'm really offended by that. I mean, really, on some level, it's just so ridiculous. Uh, recently, I was, uh, a guy referred to me, and I say a guy, it's online, so it could be a woman, 
but I'm assuming it's a guy, um, referred to me as Dr. Katz Straighted. <laughs> and I give that person high marks for creativity, if, 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 if nothing else. <laughs> um, but you notice the theme here? The theme here is that I'm not a real man, you understand? The theme here is that I'm soft, that I'm a wimp, that I've been unmanned or emasculated in some way, that, I, that my manhood is you know, in a blind trust or whatever it is, because I'm doing the bidding of women, and, I, and it, right? And it's amazing how this works. I mean, I mean by the way, what's different about that? But, uh, uh, what's different about presumably adult men, and I say presumably because, again, it's online, but presumably adult men calling me a, a mangina and questioning my manhood, what's different about that than the typical bullying situation in middle school where you so like a girl, you're a sissy, right? As a policing mechanism to try to get boys and men back into the narrow box of manhood that keeps the status quo in place. But there's not much difference. In fact, it's the same exact thing, isn't it? And Fortunately, I'm a middle-aged guy who doesn't really care about some loser calling me uh, mangina, okay? And, I, and I'm sorry to say loser. I, sh I always say this to my son. It's like I, I, my instinct is, is to think the guy's a loser, but at the same time, that's bad. <laughs> bad instinct. I, how about this misguided, unfortunate, <laughs> ignorant person calling me these names? <laughs> but like I said, fortunately, I'm, I'm confident enough to not have to really worry about what some guys are saying in that way. It's not going to stop me from doing my work. But you know, lots of young guys aren't in that position. Okay, a lot of young guys are like, I'm not going to say anything. A lot of college men, men who are in college, men who are certainly high school, college, and beyond. So in, in, the, in the adult workplace, got a lot of guys like, I don't want my fellow colleagues to think I'm soft. I don't want to think that you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, my wife's making all the decisions, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of just you know, going along. I want, I want to be, have the respect of other men. So a lot of men, as a result, they don't say anything. They don't challenge each other. They don't speak up. They don't do what they need to do because they're being policed into conformity with this norm that says that somehow a real man would never do these kind of things. A real man wouldn't take a stand on these issues, which is, to me, ridiculous. I mean, it's the opposite to me. It's like, it's like it takes more confidence and strength on the part of a man or a young man to challenge other men's sexism than it does to remain silent and be one of the guys. It's true, thank you. It takes a, it takes a lot more strength. <laughs> but unless this stuff is spoken out loud, unless this is engaged, and men engage in this conversation as well as women, um, a lot of guys are gonna be really, really, really reticent to say anything or do anything. Which is why, again, it's a, it's a leadership issue, and I'm going to get to that in a few minutes, a little bit more depth about, about this concept of leadership and men's leadership. Because, I, I mean, what guided me to work in the sports culture and the military culture was all about the idea that if we could work in the sports and military cultures with men and women, of course, but, but in this case with men, that it would be a lot harder for men outside of the sports and military cultures to claim that somehow this is a wimpy thing, it's a soft thing, because if military guys are doing it, if men in the sports culture are doing it, uh, that argument is ridiculous. And so let's have, a, let's have a conversation about the real issues. Let's have a conversation about the, about, the, about the dynamics of sexual and domestic violence, not like spend all our time writing off the people who are trying to have the conversation as somehow less than adequate or unmanly. Or in the case of women, the, the kind of names that women get called who try to, try to talk about this, the kind of ways that those women are attacked as being man-hater, male bashers, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, right, that women get called when they try to speak up, which is, of course, a time-honored tradition. It's called kill the messenger, right? So people who don't want to deal with issues, who don't want to deal with the challenges to their, to their power or to their cultural ideas or ideologies, one of the best ways to avoid the introspection that is uh, triggered by that kind of challenge is to write off the person who's issuing it. They're just angry. They just hate men. They just have an agenda. Or some, some way to make them the issue, not the ideas that they're trying to present. And by the way, the ideas are pretty basic, aren't they? People deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. Women have every bit as much as men the right to live in free, free of violence, abuse, and harassment. Sexism is wrong. Sexual violence is wrong. But violating a child's sexual or physical integrity is wrong. Violating adults' personal, physical, or sexual integrity is wrong. Everybody has a full right as a human being to be treated with respect and dignity, period, end of sentence. That's what the concept is here. 
And the idea that that's somehow radical to say that is it more of a statement about the state of the world and the state of our society than it is about anything else. That the, somehow that is a radical notion. Don't you think? I mean, it's so basic. It is so basic. Now, I have one exercise that I want to do with you here on the board, and then I'll open the floor up for questions, comments, um, dialogue. This, let me, let me ask a personal sort of uh, process question. I did a TED Talk, right? And I know that some of you probably have seen the TED Talk, but I'm sure that many of you haven't. Could I just ask how many people here have seen a TED Talk that I've done? All right, thank you very much. You're going to have to bear with me, okay, because I'm going to do an exercise that I did in the TED Talk. Um, but for those who, weren't, who haven't seen it, it's new. So just pretend that you're, please just pretend that you're not bored. Um, but this exercise deals with literally how on a sentence structure level, the way that we think, the way that our very thought process develops around the issues of domestic and sexual violence um, is itself part of the problem, okay? So this, I took from the, um, the feminist linguist Julia Penelope, I took this idea and made an exercise out of it. It starts with a very basic English sentence, John beat Mary. That's a good English sentence. John is the subject, beat is the verb, Mary is the object, good sentence. Could somebody tell me how to write the same sentence, only this time using the passive voice? Mary was beaten by John. Thank you very much. Mary was beaten by John. Mary was beaten by John. Now a whole lot has happened in one sentence. We've gone from John beat Mary to Mary was beaten by John. We've shifted our focus in one sentence from John to Mary. And as you can see, John is at the end of the sentence, which means that John is very close to dropping off the map of our uh, psychic plane. Anybody want to guess the third sentence? Very good, thank you. Mary was beaten, and now John is gone. We're not even thinking about John or talking about John. We're totally focused on Mary. What's the, ver what's the term we've used over the past generation synonymous with beaten? Battered, thank you very much. Mary was battered. And now, does anybody want to guess, those of you who didn't see the TED Talk, does anybody want to guess the final sentence in this sequence? It flows from the others, and it begins with Mary. Close. Good guesses, but it happens up. Yes, very good. Mary is a battered woman. Mary is a battered woman. So now Mary's very identity, Mary is a battered woman, is what was done to her by John in the first instance, but we've demonstrated that John has long ago left the conversation. Now, those of us who work in the domestic and sexual violence field know that victim blaming is pervasive in this realm, right? Which, which is to say, yeah, why did, why did, what did Mary do? Or why do, why do these women be attract, why are they attracted to these kind of men? Why do they keep going back to these relationships? Or what was she thinking wearing that dress or that skirt at that party, that was such a stupid decision, or why was she drinking so much and putting herself in that vulnerable position? That's victim blaming, right? There are numerous reasons for it, but one of the reasons for victim blaming is that a whole cognitive structure is set up to blame victims. In other words, this is, this is all unconscious. Our whole cognitive structure is set up to ask questions about Mary and think about Mary and her choices and what women are doing and thinking and wearing in or outside of relationships. And I don't think it's horrible to ask questions about how women end up in these situations, especially people who haven't been in those situations or worked with women or men. And I've been focusing on men's violence against women. We're going to get to men's violence against men, too. <laughs> but um, I don't think it's horrible to ask questions or to have a dialogue about how people, in this case women, end up in these situations. But let's be clear, it's not going to get us anywhere in terms of preventing violence. It might be, it might be good in terms of providing services to victims and survivors, fine. But in terms of preventing violence, we have to ask a different set of questions. And you can see where I'm going with this, right? I mean, the questions aren't, aren't about Mary. The questions are, are about John. The questions are things like, why do so many American men abuse their wives, their girlfriends, or, or boyfriends, or other women and girls? Why? What's going on with men, right? I mean, that's the, the key question to me. What, why do so many men sexually assault women and children? I mean, sexual assault is such a big problem. Rape is such a big problem on college campuses, in the US military, in communities rich and poor, and everywhere in between. Rape is still a big problem. All of 
world rape is a big problem in conflict zones and in non-conflict zones. I mean, it's in wealthy countries and in developing and poor countries, right? I mean, it's a problem everywhere. What's going on? Why, why are societies continuing to bruise men who sexually abuse uh, women and girls as well as uh, other men and boys? Why is the sexual abuse of children by adult men such a common story in our society? Sexual abuse of children? I mean, in 100 years, if they, you know, one of these time capsules, they open it up from the late 20th and early 21st century. One of the things that that's gonna, they're going to see is in the late 20th century, early 21st century, sexual abuse of children was a huge problem in our society. It is. How pathetic is that? And who are the perpetrators? Overwhelmingly, it's men and young men. That's a fact. It's not a debatable point. Why is it? The question is why. Is, is it because men are born biologically predestined to be abusive? I don't think so. I'm too... I think that's anti-male to think that. I think it's those of us who care about and respect men know that it's not about biological determinism. It's about a culture that is teaching boys and men a certain kind of manhood, and, and some of them are acting on it. And so it's our responsibility as a culture. What are we doing? And, and, what, and what are the, what's the role of the various institutions in our society and all over the world? What's the role of the various institutions in helping to establish and maintain ideologies of manhood? What is the social, how is the socialization of boys implicated? What is, how is family structure implicated? What about religious belief systems? What about the sports culture and the role that it plays in teaching ideologies and ideas about manhood, about womanhood? All of this. What's the pornography culture? What's the role of pornography culture in helping to normalize certain kind of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors uh, uh, related to sex and violence and any number of other issues? What's the role of any number of other forms of media in helping to shape social norms? In other words, all of this needs to be part of the conversation. Because men are not born, I'm, I'm, I'm making a declarative statement here, men are not, male children are not born predetermined to be abusive. They are taught to be abusive. They are acted upon and then they are taught how to respond to the, the way that they're acted upon, both you know, physically and sexually and every other way. And we can talk about this, again, briefly, when we, uh, certainly when we open up the conversation about, about media and cultural influences. But we're not going to have any of that conversation as long as we endlessly focus on, on what women are doing, thinking, and wearing. And it's amazing in the discourse in the United States how incredibly degendered the conversation is often about sexual violence and domestic violence, and how often people don't use gender-specific terms. They talk about people hurting each other and what's going on. And it's just so frustrating because really, really, the honest conversation about masculinity is really what we need to be having. Is that anti-male? I don't think so. In fact, I think it's ridiculous to say that that's anti-male. And one of the reasons why it's ridiculous is that guess who the primary victims of most forms of violence are? It's men and boys. That's who. Primary victims, with the exception of sexual violence, when women are the primary victims of sexual violence, the primary victims of most other forms of violence are men and boys. With murder, attempted murder, assault, aggravated assault, bullying, gay bashing. Men are the primary victims, but we are the primary victims of other men's violence. That's not a coincidence, or that's not a, a, a sort of a, an ancillary fact. That's a, incredibly important. The same system that produces men who abuse women produces men who abuse other men. And so if we want to reduce violence against men, guess what? Reducing the culture that produces violence against women is a way of reducing the, 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 changing the culture that produces men's violence against, against each other. And yes, there are women who violate men. There are women who are abusive to men in an interpersonal relationships and, you know, and you know, teachers sexually abusing boy students. I appreciate that. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but let's not create some false equivalence that somehow, okay, men are abusing women, but women are also abusing men, and as if that somehow that they're equatable, which is nonsense, flat out nonsense, right? So it doesn't mean that I'm saying it's okay, it's not okay for women to abuse men, but let's not, be, let's not kid ourselves about the level, comparatively speaking, and as a man and as men, I think our first responsibility is to talk about men's violence, not to shift the conversation. This is what happens with the, the so-called men's rights movement, is that the moment you start talking about men's violence against women, they just shift the conversation. What about women who are assaulting men? It's like, I'm sorry, you're not on center stage right now. We're talking about the biggest problem, which is men assaulting women. And saying that, oh, but well, the women who are assaulting men is a way to just shift the focus right away, not even give it the time of day to have the conversation about the bigger problem, and to take the, the attention off right? And take it back to something that they feel strongly about, which is another w way of them exercising illegitimate male privilege, isn't it? So there's my feeling about that. <laughs> Anybody want to ask a question, make a comment about this exercise, about anything that I've said about the linguistic uh, structures that, that, that help to shape our thinking? Any, anything. Let me just, one last parenthetical note here. 
I always have to make a decision. Anybody who's an educator has to make a decision. When you have a finite period of time, what's, what's the most effective way to spend that time? And I always come back to, if you can help people think about how they think, then it has exponential effects. So I, I think it's important to spend some time on the language piece, because I just, because if, if you haven't been thinking about this the way that I've been talking about it, you'll never be able to see a, a sentence in, this, in, in, the, in the media or elsewhere the same way. You'll say, oh my god, how did that person write that sentence? How did that person write that brochure and not mention men? How is that possible? It happens all the time, let me say. I was listening, just listening to a podcast a couple days ago by women in the movement, okay, in the college-based sexual assault prevention movement. They talked for 20 minutes right, on this, on this podcast about, uh, about sexual violence prevention and never once mentioned the word men, never once did the word men come up in the conversation. It's like, how do you talk about rape prevention and not mention men? It's like the central issue. But I, but I appreciate that probably because they've been so acculturated to like, okay, you don't really say that because if you say that, then men are going to get defensive and you don't want men to get defensive, so you don't say it. And then what happens? It, what happens is you don't really deal with the issues. And that's the state we're in in a lot of places in the culture. Comments, questions, thoughts? Yes? So you, you threw out some great ideas and you hit a lot of prover, prover, proverbial nails on the head, easy to say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obvious this is a learned thing. And so to, to address this, we have to unlearn that behavior. But um, I, I look at the stories that are in, in media, and media plays a big role in this. And we've seen that the, the punishing of women in India by rape has become uh, headline news uh, lately. So there's a lot of cultural uh, uh, influences in, in, in a lot of this behavior. I don't know how you're going to address that at all during the event, but I wanted to toss that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's so much. Um, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to be concise, not one of my strengths, um, especially when it comes to how deep some of this stuff is, I mean, how much there is. So let me just say, I appreciate your point, although I would ask you to think about this, everybody. Um, we often say learned behavior, right? So we say, okay, if it's not biologically predetermined or genetically um, preordained, it's probably learned behavior, right, violence? I'd rather say it's taught behavior, right? Because if you say it's learned behavior, it's passive. Like, they just kind of learn it. I'd rather say it's taught behavior, because if you shift the, the, the terminology from learned behavior to taught behavior, it shifts the onus of responsibility onto those of us who are teaching our sons and daughters uh, what it means to be a man or a woman. It, it, it shifts the responsibility onto the culture and the ways in which we acculturate and socialize the next generation, okay? That's a key, I think that's a key point because um, we do need to be putting the onus of responsibility on those of us who are influential, whether it's parents or others, in terms of what we teach. Um, and then, of course, culture. See, pe people often think culture is like somehow a reference to uh, communities of color or the developing world. Everybody has culture. We're all part of a culture. Right? Culture is everything. I mean, culture is everything that isn't genetic or biological. It's like, it's like the nature-nurture debate. It's like people say, well, wh which side do you fall on, the nature side or the nurture side? And, it's like, you know, one thing we know, I think, I can say this almost definitively in the 21st century, is it's not either nature or nurture. It's obviously a complex combination of both. So everybody, all human behavior is a complex combination of genetics and biological factors and social and socially taught and learned behaviors and cultural norms. And it's a, it's a complex mix. I mean, obviously, my focus and the focus of a lot of the people in the work, of course, most people in the work, is, is, is culture. It's the nurture side. If you want to reduce it to the binary, it's, of course, the nurture side. And by the way, people will say, OK, we have this biological. Violence has been around forever. And you're not going to change that. And somehow the feminist project to change men is like doomed to failure because we are you know, violent. And we've always been, as a species, violent. It's like, like my son would say, duh. It's like, OK, we hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I agree that the propensity and the capacity for violence is biologically programmed into our species, without doubt. But guess what? If the, if the, 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 if the ability or propensity for violence is biologically predetermined on some level, then the, the, the propensity for nonviolence is also biological, isn't it? <laughs> because and most men, for example, are not violent, right? Why is that? Well, you could say that it's biologically predetermined that we're not violent, because most men are not violent, and, and most men throughout history have not been violent, so therefore, it must be biological. The question isn't whether it's biological or not. The question is, how do we organize our societies? 
How do we organize the social norms in those societies to re reduce violence and abuse rather than emphasize it? Yes, we have the capacity for it. Of course we do. But do we do it? No, we don't. I mean, do most of us engage in that violent behavior? No, we don't. Because we've made decisions and we've organized our societies in such a way that we don't uh, uh, have to, you know, have to uh, submit to that um, and such. Any other comments or questions? Yes. How do you feel about the phrase intimate partner violence? We see more of that in the literature. Thank you. Do people hear? How do I uh, respond to this phrase, intimate partner violence? We see a lot of that in the literature. I'm not, I, I, don't, I won't repeat every question because I'll try to answer the question, in the, I mean, repeat the question in the context of my answer to make it quicker. Um, you know, it's descriptive on one level. It's degendered. I mean, I, don't, I, I personally don't like degendered language. I think it's useful sometimes. I, I, I mean, there are, there are situations. I wouldn't, I'm not a like, you know, fundamentalist on this question. There are times when you can use degendered language and it's accurate and it's okay. I mean, I'll say domestic violence sometimes, and I don't, like the ter I don't like the term domestic violence, but you know, you can say it. I mean, it's not horrible and people know what it means. So intimate partner violence is a more inclusive category because that does include uh, male to male, female to female, you know, female to male, you know, it, it, it's, more, it's a more broad category. So if you really want to make a comment about relationships, then intimate partner violence <clears throat> Carries, you know, it, it carries a greater sort of, uh, you know, uh, circumference of issues. Oh, you wouldn't see it as something like dating, marriage. Right, that's right. Marriage is not the key issue at all. So, I mean, intimate partner, in that sense, is okay. I mean, if if it's used as a way to not talk about men and men's violence, then I have a problem with it. And I, I don't, I just don't think. I mean, again, this is a political position. Some people could agree or disagree. I just don't think that it's useful to to degender this conversation. I, I, I think that's not the real world. The real world is, the, the, the heart of the matter is gender. And if you don't talk about that, then you're not, you're not, none of the solutions are gonna work because you haven't addressed the real root of the issue. Anybody else? A Couple more and then we're gonna take, I know we're gonna take our, our break. Yes? Anger is stated to be uh, caused internal depression. Are we as parents uh, unconsciously uh, allowing or teaching our young men to be angry and to not ways and means to resolve some of it? Okay, good question. I'll, again, I'll repeat the question in the context of my answer. I think, I think what we're, I, I mean, this is, this, is, this is not anything like an original insight on my part, but um, I think still, even though we've made a lot of progress, and I'm making a general statement here, we've made a lot of progress over the past several decades in expanding the palette of what is acceptable to, in terms of being a man and, having, and, and the emotional range that we're allowed to express and still be quote unquote man or manly or somehow you know, credible as men. Um, we still have anger still is the single most powerful emotion that is legitimized and accepted in men. So a lot of men immediately go to anger when they have a whole range of other emotional responses that they can't articulate, understand, or come to terms with. It goes immediately to anger. So grief and disappointment and hurt get transformed very quickly into anger because anger is socially acceptable. So I think a lot of times what we're talking about when we say men's anger is really something else that, can, that, that, that can, then gets identified as anger. And individually, men are much more comfortable express, many times, are much more comfortable expressing anger than some of those other emotions. And one of the reasons for that is that some of those other emotions suggest vulnerability. Vulnerability, which has been in the, in the gender binary coded feminine. So you don't want to present yourself as somehow vulnerable. So you transform it to, into anger and all of a sudden you're masculine. You're still masculine. I mean, one of the things about, about some of the rampage killings, I mean, a huge number of rampage killings in the United States and school shootings are done by boys and men who have suffered grievous insult. They've suffered grievous shame. They've been violated themselves. They've been bullied themselves. They've, like, the school shootings are almost all, I mean, uh, honestly, the school shootings are an uh, example of this, right? School shootings are overwhelmingly perpetrated by young men and boys who have been bullied, marginalized, socially awkward, and feeling angry about that, and, and they, they develop a revenge fantasy about what to do about their being bullied. They easily acquire guns in this society, and they enact this revenge fantasy. This is what, this is what school shootings are. It's not even that complicated, right? And by the way, if, we've been studying this now for 
almost 20 years. In other words, we have lots of data and, and lots of quotes from and lots of first-person accounts of boys who, have been not, who, who haven't died in those shootings and who have given all kinds of interviews and testimony. So much of it is about their manhood. And the quickest way to establish your manhood or reestablish it if it's been taken from you is through violence, right? I mean, I mean, I mean the, si the single quickest way is, to, is, to, is through violence. And we have cultural narratives all over the place. This is one of my films. My most recent film deals with this at length. We have all these cultural narratives in media and movies and s music and everything else that says if, if, you as, if you're a boy or a man and something's been taken from you, certainly through violence, the way to get it back is through violence. And so... Um, a lot of these men, for example, adult men, forget about the school shooter boys, but, but the uh, adult men who go out on these, on these killing rampages at, at their workplace or their wife breaks up with them or there's some kind of, then they kill the whole family or they go into her workplace and start shooting people. It's, there's all other, there are the dynamics, I appreciate that, but I, I think a central one is they're dealing with grief and loss and disappointment and hurt and the way that they have chosen to deal with it is through violence. And again, that's not a coincidence. This is all connected to how we teach boys and men to respond to insult, to, um, to, to loss of power, to the loss of control, and to uh, other forms of emotional pain and panic. And, and, I, and so, so there's where I think, I mean, there's, there's a, this is the beginning of a conversation. Let me just say, for anybody who's interested, James Gilligan, if anybody's interested, James Gilligan is a psychiatrist, now retired, but a brilliant uh, man. He's written two books about violence. One is called Violence, and the other is called Preventing Violence. <laughs> and his, his, he, was a, he was the um, chief of psychiatry at uh, Bridgewater State Hospital in my home state of Massachusetts uh, for many years, and he worked with many, many violent men over the course of his career. And I mean, when I say violent, I mean some really brutal murder men. And, and, and he comes up, he, his book is brilliant. He really examines how shame, the experience of shame, is, is the central issue we need to talk about in, in terms of men's perpetration of violence because, because these feelings of shame that men acquire for any number of reasons, it could be social marginalization and it certainly could be their own violent victimization. Those feelings of shame are addressed by so many men in this, with this script of someone took something from me, I'm gonna take it from somebody else. And that, again, that's what school shootings are, aren't they? And by the way, school shootings, they often, often the victims of these shootings are not even the people who were alleged to have been the bullies in the first instance, but the site of the school shooting is critical. It's not, he didn't, the guy didn't go to some, you know, somewhere else. He went to the school because that was the site of the degradation. And, and, and shooting people at that site is the way he's reclaiming his manhood. I, I believe what happened in Newtown, Connecticut was that boy, those kids were props. They were theatrical props in Adam Lanz's performance of an aggrieved masculinity, an aggrieved manhood, he had been socially ridiculed and marginalized for much of his life, and he was gonna show people what pain he was in, and he was gonna make them feel the same kind of pain that he felt. The kid, he didn't know those kids, he didn't have anything against those kids, they were just theatrical props in his performance of an aggrieved manhood. To me, that's the, that's, that's the most uh, insightful uh, understanding of, of school shootings. One more question, then we're gonna take a break. Yes. Um. All of this is great in terms of intellectual discussion and, and introducing concepts. What can we in our community do in addressing the male and female leadership of our community? What steps, action steps, can we take to actually start to affect some change? And what do we do to, need to do for the transformation of this in our community and cultures around the nation and the world? Thank you. Let me say, this is a big question, but let me just say in, in response, two things. And then we are going to address this when we come back. I mean, to the extent that the time is going to allow us, that's exactly what the next step is. Like, what are, the, what are some strategies and stuff? But the first, the, my first response is, is, here we are in an educational institution. Knowledge is power, okay? The more you know, the more you are able to think critically about what the next steps are. So I, I don't think, I think this is an action step. I think what we're engaged in is an action step. I wouldn't, I wouldn't create a false dichotomy between, okay, intellectual discussion and action. Intellectual discussion is action because you have to understand culture. You have to understand systems. You have to understand how these things fit together if you're going to be agenic and successful in changing and transforming those systems. So I would say that's the one key point. And the second point is, yes, we're going to address that directly when we come back. And again, I'm just going to give you some highlights because there's way more, as you can see, than we can possibly deal with in the time frame. Mindy, do you want to make an announcement about the break? Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to take a break in just a second, but we have the great good fortune um, as part of the Commission on the Status of uh, Women, we uh, function uh, under the Board of County Commissioners. And Commissioner Kevin Beckner is with us today. He's going to be pre presenting a proclamation. Um, but I just want to mention personally um, how delighted I am he was able to join us because this is a particular passion of Kevin's. He is actually chairing the Community Violence Prevention Collaborative, which is a multi-government uh, project, all of the cities. Um, and the county joining together along with uh, nonprofit social services, faith community, a whole bunch of folks to try and, um, and to really dig deep into why community violence occurs specifically in our community and what we can do to stop the violence. So I'm delighted to have he Kevin here today. He's going to share a few words and then we will take our break. Kevin. Well, thank you, Mindy. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here today on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners. And uh, you all enjoying the talk so far by Dr. Katz over here? Let's give him a round of applause. And Mindy, I'm going to place this down here. I don't have a lot of space up here, but um, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank um, the, uh, uh, the Spring and the League of Women Voters and everybody that have come together to put this program on, um, because it's, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today. And as many of you know and are learning, violence is widespread and devastating to society as a whole, but particularly to women and children. I mean, the, the statistics are absolutely staggering. One in f every four women will experience domestic violence during her lifetime. Approximately 15.5 million children are exposed to domestic violence each year. And one in three young people are affected by physical, sexual, or verbal dating violence, with one in five in a serious relationship reporting having been slapped, pushed, hit, threatened, or coerced by a partner. How many of you find those unbelievable statistics? Well, as I learned and been through research in my passion to uh, prevent violence, um, these type of statistics caused me to pause and ask just one very simple question. Why? Think about this, why? Why in a country where we have so many democratic freedoms, where we have prosperity that outpaces most other countries in the entire world, where we, where we have the freedom to become whoever we want, yet there are so many people that are shackled by the chains of violence and have become involved in the circular issue of violence in their lives. Why? That was something that drove me to go further, especially after what happened in Sandy Hook. And uh, it, it kind of asked me to say, what are we doing as public officials, and what are we doing to address violence in our community? And what I have found is that typically, the topic of violence usually only gets discussed, other than in forums like this, when? when there are mass shootings, when there are big public events. But ladies and gentlemen, there were over in 2012, 1.2 million incidences of violence across this country in 2012. Of those incidents of violence, as tragic as they were, 88 were from mass shootings. The question is, what about all the other victims of violence? In Hillsborough County, in 2012, actually between 2008 and 2012, we have found a reduction in of, of about 45% in violent crimes. However, we still had over 7,500 incidences of domestic violence, over 4,000 incidences of violent crimes, and 10,000 cases of child abuse. And that does not even begin to account for all of the children that have experienced and people that experienced and witness acts of violence. As we know, violence, especially domestic violence, is one of the most underreported crimes in our country. So what does it take to change the culture? I would suggest to you today, as a woman asks, what can we do? We have to start with shifting our paradigm and how we think about violence. 
Violence, I believe, and I would suggest and hypothesize to you, we think about it as a law enforcement responsibility. That it is more something that we react to. That law enforcement reacts to, and we have great agencies like the Spring and so many others that help the victims, but the question is, how do we prevent violence in the first place? And how we do that is we shift our paradigm. We no longer think about violence as a public safety issue, but it is a public health issue. As you have probably learned or will learn, that there are many factors that perpetrate violence. You have socioeconomic factors. You've got mental health issues. You've got substance abuse issues, educational issues. There are a dimension of different factors that causes an individual to commit violence. We hear about gun violence, but gun violence and the, a gun is the means to commit violence. It doesn't get to the root causes of why an individual commits an act of violence. And that's why I appreciate the, the work of Dr. Katz because that also goes so much deeper. So ladies and gentlemen, as, as a community, we must stand together and as a county, we are doing just what you had described. We are coming together with all of the major partners from the municipal, the county governments, the uh, public defender's office, the state attorney's office, the school system, and we also have 85 other community members that represents mental health, that represents substance abuse, that represents um, economic groups, people that are engaged and understand all the many different cultures from the faith-based community to help bring this community together to stop violence before it begins. And that's got to be the long-term goal of our community. And until we reach that, we will continue. And you have my commitment and the commitment of the Board of County Commissioners that we will stand with the spring, we will stand with this whole entire community to prevent violence, but also to make sure that we're there to help serve the victims of violence and especially domestic violence in our community. Um, so at this time, I wanna call forward and thank especially um, Mindy Murphy, if you wanna join me back up here from the spring. And then also Yvonne Fry, if you would join me as well from the, uh, um, the Commission of the Status of Women, sorry. And on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, would like to thank and recognize you for what you do in our community to address the issue of violence. And thank you so much for holding value and sponsoring valuable forums like this. And this is what we believe will continue to help break down um, and get to the root causes of violence and help prevent it from, that, from happening in the first place. So thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And if there's anything that I can do to help serve this community, uh, you'll have my contact information, and I hope you do reach out. So thank you again.